normally um, Fred Evans would be your host. I am the guest host along with uh, Lisa Levers from Education uh, and with, with uh, lots and lots of help from Matt Valentin, who is here somewhere. Where right here. Yeah. Oh, there you are, okay. Um, who is our <coughs> Seeker Fellow and, and does a tremendous amount of work, so it's very, 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 very uh, necessary all these things to um, work without Fred. Uh, we have a lot of good stuff happening in March and April. Two external speakers who will be coming. Um, both very well known. I'm very excited about both of them. We have Dr. Max Van Manen. Do you want to say a few words about him, Lisa? Because I think you know more about his work. I don't know. We don't have to. Essentially, uh, <clears throat> Professor Van Manen is a phenomenologist. He works with a methodology called hermeneutical phenomenology. Um, he's also managed to connect that with pedagogy um, and has just done some very interesting things in that arena, has used uh, hermeneutic phenomenology to do research with children, develop best practices with children um, and others. So he's a very dynamic speaker. It's been and very, very down to earth at the same time. It's been a lot of fun for me interacting with him over the phone. So he will be giving a public lecture on Thursday evening, March 12th, from 7 o'clock until 8.30 in room Matt, 508? Uh, 608. 608. I knew I was going to get something wrong there. Yeah, yeah. Room 608 in the student union. And then the next day, Friday the 13th, guess we didn't think that one out. Um, or maybe it's OK. <laughs> on, on Friday, he will be speaking in the same room, 608 Student Center, from 11 in the morning until 1 in the afternoon. So if you're able to come to either or both, please do. And you will be seeing shortly, <coughs> maybe actually right now, our amazing poster uh, around campus. I'll pass this around. Um, so you can take a look, and if you want to jot down times and locations and so forth, you're welcome to do that. In April, we have Dr. Anna Defina, Professor of Italian Language and Linguistics from the Italian Department, Georgetown University. More details <coughs> coming. Um, so, lots of good stuff. Today we have uh, Norm Conti. Um, I think it's fair to say that, that Professor Conti is our leading expert at Duquesne on policing. Very, very important topic. We have an event coming up in March 20, 25th all day on, on uh, policing and, and grace. And I don't know if Lena, you want to say anything about Sure, that? yeah. So March 25th we have what we're calling a day of learning and speaking out. It's an all day event takes apart the issue of the use of lethal force amongst police and the, the race issues that that has raised for us. And it's taken apart in lots of different formats, and so there are some papers being read and some panel discussions, as well as a couple of student sessions around how we organize ourselves as students to think about race and our role as educated citizens. Um, we also have a deep dive workshop around race in our teaching and how we intersect with that. And then finally, we close up the whole Day with a panel discussion around rights, civil rights, um, the use of reasonable expectation and force amongst police, and uh, it's going to be great. It kind of covers audiences all across the university, and so it's March 25th. Um, takes place primarily in the Silverman Center. Student sessions are going to be in 109 Union. Silverman Center is in the library. Also, if you could uh, sign our. our uh, little sheet going around and put your email address and that way we'll notify you about all of these things. So, in case you forget. Hi, Norm Conti, uh, leading expert at UK on policing. Uh, published a ton of stuff in a wide variety of areas. Ethnographies of recruitment, social therapy, ethics training, masculinity and policing, two analyses of social networks that develop within recruit cohorts co-authored an article on destigmatization, book chapters on social crime prevention, sustained dialogue and hate crime, doing a lot of things today, including examining the emergence of trust and the role of humor in police academy training. He's, um, I think it's fair to say also that he may be the university's leading expert on Irving Goffman, who's 
the most important post-World War II sociologist. So really nice that you agreed to talk to us today. And, uh, why you take it away? Thank you. Um, first of all, we're very lucky to have Jesse Wozniak here. I, I told him I was going to put him on the spot. He didn't know. He came out into this blind. Jesse is a, uh, he's been at WVU for two years as a sociologist. Before that, he went to Iraq to study uh, police training there. Wow. And this, when I heard about this, I was blown away because I went to Cleveland to <laughs> study police training. It still might be something that would get scary. Could have some similarities. <laughs> Maybe, depend, anyway. So Jesse, uh, in October, published an article in the American Sociologist called When the Going Gets Weird, An Invitation to Gonzo Sociology. Right, and uh, this was right up my alley, and I read it, and I'm writing an article. That this is an article that I intend to publish in the same journal, uh, and I'm, I'm very grateful to Justin. Hopefully, he can talk about. It. I brought copies for everyone, just in case, because, because that's how we do it at the Catholic school, not the not WBU, where I worked for four years. So, um, there's Justin's paper. Hopefully, at the end. We can bring Jesse into the discussion. Today I'm gonna to be doing things I usually never do, uh, which is actually reading some of the paper. Uh, usually my papers aren't written when I'm doing a presentation. I'm also gonna be using PowerPoint, which I'm just not usually organized enough to have together to actually do a presentation. Okay, so I'm gonna read for about 10 minutes and then I'm gonna show you a bunch of fun pictures. So hang on. Are you ready? So the article is called More Like Sons of Conformity, Motorcycle Clubs, Moral Careers, and Normalization. See, that's a, a play on words. Oh. All right. <clears throat> a therapist once told me I was a wolf. He explained, you don't subscribe to any particular morality. You create your own, and that is a higher morality. You're a player. You're sanguine, full of blood. You would make an excellent criminal. You'd be successful on the street, and if you had to go upstate, you'd probably do very well there too, though your looks could be a problem. And you have to understand that you're aggressive, and this is fundamental to your nature. It cannot be changed. You are a wolf. At the time, I couldn't accept his assessment, so I imagined he was just using a familiar sociological frame to coach me out of a debilitating degree of insecurity. So I protested that this notion of post-conventional morality couldn't apply to me. This should have been obvious because circumstances had left me so anxious that I had developed an assortment of twitches and my teeth rarely stopped chattering. In rebuttal to this claim, he pointed to the correlation between fear and aggression. He further noted that my career probably wasn't exciting enough for me anymore and ran down a list of outlets for my wolfishness that included everything from uh, volunteer firefighting to a career shift in the direction of politics or business. <laughs> Finally, he suggested maybe I could just take up something like martial arts or paintball in my free time, of which I had none. I gave this to my kid's karate teacher. Uh, since most of my anxiety stemmed from the interrelated issues of work, money, and fatherhood, none of these options, not even paintball, uh, struck me as particularly realistic solutions. So he brought the focus back to the bigger point. You don't need to eliminate your aggressive characteristics. You probably can't. They're what make you who you are. I keep coming back to the same thought about you. Norm is normal. You just need to channel your deviant tendencies into something more socially acceptable, like your work on policing. You go out and tell cops how to be cops. Something like that, only sexier. <laughs> you have to find a way to be a benign badass. At this point, I decided that instead of paintball, maybe I should start looking for a new therapist. <laughs> Still, his point stuck with me. And looking back at his notes on the session, it's easy to understand why. Client name, Norman Conti. Date of service, April 30th, 2009. DX296.25, major depressive disorder. Uh, single mild, I don't know what that means, maybe Susan can tell us. Client returns for follow-up. He was last seen about a month ago. He maintains an effective, he maintain, he reports maintenance of effective gains. He notes continued gains in terms of self-acceptance. He notes chronic boredom, possibly depressive anhedonia. 
a humanistic view of his anhedonia is entertained. Namely, Klein's desire for excitement is discussed in terms of his baseline temperament and ambition for leadership. Klein's leadership-oriented ambitions and excitement-seeking are normalized as legitimate pursuits of well-being. Klein is given feedback that he appears to have successfully sublimated his alpha traits in a variety of socially sanctioned ways, e.g. via education and academic and research pursuits. Are you laughing because you're a psychologist or because, or because you know me? Uh, it, you're not sure. She's not even sure. Uh, okay. Uh, Clyde welcomed this deep pathologizing view of self as yet another new, more self-accepting narrative to counteract the presagetic perfectionist self-schema. Klein appears to be progressing well both in terms of inter- and intrapersonal dynamics. He's scheduled to return for a follow-up in May. Though I hadn't seen these notes at the time, I understood that shifting focus from my own misery to an interesting research project would undoubtedly have therapeutic value. So, the discovery that my old boxing trainer and longtime family friend was starting a chapter of an outlaw motorcycle club, OMC, known as the Visigoths, presented a great opportunity for both ethnography and psychological relief. Footnote. Visigoths is a pseudonym that I am using for this one percenter motorcycle club in order to avoid being murdered. <laughs> <laughs> or at the very least severely beaten in the unlikely event that a Visigoth might come across this article. <laughs> I mean, even a wolf has to have some boundaries. <laughs> Additionally, it has the latent effect of providing anonymity for the motorcycle club though I cannot see why they should need it in this context. Um, like any idea for a research <coughs> project, it existed purely as fantasy until I began pursuing it. This article explores that landscape between the research imagination and practice, as well as a concomitant transition in self. Though this be madness, there is a method section in it. Uh, you know what that's about. Uh, my plan for entree into the group hinged upon the decade-long friendship between the leader of the Visigoths, let's call him Thor, and my brother. Footnote. As you might expect, his name, in fact, is not Thor. <laughs> Calling him this helps to protect his identity, and my therapist would agree, is yet another of my legitimate pursuits of well-being. Hunter S. Thompson made it clear that being stumped by a motorcycle gang would not be in my best interest. Um, at this point, I was beyond certain that a familial connection would provide a short entrance into the Visigoths. As with my previous ethnographies, data would be collected through participant observation over some course of time, maybe a year or so. My plan was to spend as much time with the gang, gang as possible by attending runs. Those are the guys getting on their bikes, everyone comes to, together at a certain point, they kind of like a camp out and party. Uh, in time, I would undoubtedly strike up friendships with the more sociologically interesting members of the club, and these relationships would yield invaluable insights into the backstage world of outlaw bikers. In the end, I would have a stack of notebooks containing a treasure trove of data. These data would be analyzed from a grounded theory perspective, where field notes are coded for emerging processes and themes. Uh, Analytic memos would become essential in understanding the structure and function of the group when the significance of key cultural elements such as masculinity, solidarity, or whatever began to emerge, the field notes would be reviewed once more in order to determine how these notions shape the milieu. Eventually, it would become clear that particular narratives and rituals were important mechanisms for illustrating normative orders and facilitating progress through the moral career of the outlaw biker. You know, all the usual mythological tropes. <laughs> Seeing rejection as a distinct improbability, I began to imagine my time with the Visigoths and the tools I would need for the project. First, I would have to blend in. So I started watching Sons of Anarchy, an adaptation of Hamlet, set within an OMC of the same name. Footnote, Sons of Anarchy aired on the FX network, which had recently shifted its slogan from, there is no box, TV, um, box, uh, to fearless, so it would appear that the very network itself is a fitting home for both wolves and outlaws alike. Um, the guys in the club looked as you would expect, long hair, beards, tattoos, jewelry, jeans, leather jackets, since I already had a pair of jeans and a goatee, the next 
logical step was to stop getting my hair cut for 18 months or so, now three years. Uh, this was no problem and allowed me to reallocate the money I was saving to Barber to other research expenses. <laughs> <laughs> snorted. Um, being tattooed to the point of a unique racial categorization is a ubiquitous feature of the outlaw culture and presented a potential problem for me. While I have the great fortune of a popular malt liquor logo forever emblazoned on my left shoulder, <laughs> true. I wasn't sure how to work that into my presentation of self without seeming, well, desperate. <laughs> I could have gotten more visible tattoos, but that would have constituted an expense far beyond my haircut savings. As a compromise, I settled on earrings and added and adding 40 pounds of muscle to my chest, arms, and back in order to convey the type of tough guy narcissism expressed in so much body art. Much to my delight, the two-hour sessions in the weight room as well as innumerable tasty protein shakes offered endorphin-tastic relief to my major depressive order and anhedonia which led to a commitment to bodybuilding beyond ethnographic costuming. Later I discovered that even the creatine supplements so popular among weight room bros had clinical value for treating my depression. The only thing I was going to need now was a motorcycle. <laughs> We're getting there. You think, think like a tenure track battle. Uh, outlaw clubs are very particular about transportation and anything other than a high-powered Harley Davidson <coughs> motorcycle is generally outside of their cultural bounds. Obviously, a vehicle of this class would be an important tool for the project, as I was sociologically imagining it. More importantly, I would get to ride around on it. On eBay, these motorcycles range between five dollars and $15,000. Lacking that sort of personal research budget, I started considering the sorts of internal grants that might fund a chopper. <laughs> yeah, that was going to be me. Pittsburgh's answer to C. Wright Mills charging down the qualitative <laughs> highway on a hog paid for by one of the top Catholic universities. <laughs> <laughs> there was something about this combination of the sacred and profane that made the image all the more alluring. At the same time, applications to the College of Liberal Arts Ethnographic Transportation Fund would undoubtedly require a lot of paperwork. Not to mention meetings with the Dean, IRB, University Council, and most likely a number of my valued colleagues in psychology. Mm -hmm. Leaving the final methodological issue on the back burner, I began reading everything I could get my hands on related to OMCs. So here's where I'm going to shift away from the paper. Because I can kind of give you the story of outlaw motorcycle clubs <coughs> and movie posters. Okay, so these are really like two different papers. One of them is, is sort of this, my story with this and whatever that means, and the other is the movie posters, okay? So, this is 1947, Hollister, California. This is, uh, there were a couple, there was a, every year the American Motorcycle Association would, ho would hold a rally, and they'd, they'd bring on motorcycles and they'd have races and hill climbing and guys riding around their motorcycles. And this year, there were two clubs, uh, the Pissed Off Bastards of Bakersfield, Poe Bob was how it was, uh, how it was condensed, and the Booze Fighters got in a, a fight there, and they, don't kind of, they rode their motorcycles into bars, and 50 of them went to the hospital, and 50 of them got arrested. Uh, but this got framed as like, the gangs took over the town. It was like, they made trouble for a few hours, they didn't like, take over the town. Um, so this is a, a picture a staged photo that was taken, you can tell, they, you know, they, they put the beer bottle there and they made him hold his coat like that, it wasn't exactly real. He was probably drunk. Um, here's what it really looked like, they, you know, they're riding their motorcycles around, falling off of them. Uh, there's a guy getting arrested by a milkman, I think, I'm not sure. <laughs> they, had, they had the power to arrest in certain, past the expiration date. <laughs> I just made that up. Uh, Oh, so after that, that's 1947. Here's 1954. You get the first motorcycle biker movie, The Wild One, which is which is a you know a retelling of this story, a total fictionalization. Here's Marlon Brando, right? And there's some sort of romantic thing, and there's fighting, right? So this they they blew it up in the media that this was a huge event, and then they made a movie out of it, and then they made more and more movies out of it. This is the next 1958. The Hot Angel. Notice the theme. Oh, I forgot to do. 
I to make this more fun for you, I brought scorecards. So I'm gonna pass those out. And when you see a theme, you can check a box. And whoever gets the, r the right scores, I'm gonna give them an autographed uh, flyer of this event. And they can, <laughs> they can have that professionally framed. It'd be nice for them and their family. Future generations. Future generations. So theme, the horde, right? The horde is a big group. The rumble is the fight. Romance, you see it. Uh, corruption, female corruption. The female leg as a frame, or legs as a frame. Keep your eyes open. You check the box every time you see these, and we're going to get a thing. Um, female victimization, real one percenters, Peter Fonda, Dennis Hartman, or Jack Nicholson. So you check. This could have been a drinking game because there's wine, but do what you want to do. Um, <laughs> Ready for the next one? Motor Psycho. The Russ Meyer, we know what the film was about. Russ Meyer people. Um, the three guys on motorcycles who drive around and attack women, basically. That's what that movie is. That's 1965. 1966, Life Magazine sent a photographer out with the Hells Angels. And they took some really amazing uh, pictures <coughs> that they never published until recently because that's how harsh the reaction against the outlaw bikers was at the time. So this is the horde, right? All the guys running. And this is what they look like for real. This is just a couple of the guys. There's a young woman saying hello to everyone. This is, okay. Outlaw motorcycle gangs kind of came about in the 60s, right? As working class white men were finding it hard and harder and harder to get status in society, these guys were like often referred to as the losers, but they grouped up and found ways to make their own counterculture where they could achieve status among themselves through, through deviance, through outrageous behavior. This is an example of, of uh, righteousness. Dem you're demonstrating righteousness or true class motorcycle tricks. He, this is also done standing up. So that, remember that image, we'll come back to something like that later. Here's really what all the, you know, they were mostly just drinking and playing pool and hanging out in the clubhouses. The guy with the, the, guy with the bandage on his head, that's Sonny Barger. He's like the, one of the classic Hell's Angels. Um, and he hurt his head on a motorcycle. Uh, at the same time, there was a, there was an accusation of a statutory rape at one of their uh, runs, and the media just ran with it and went crazy, and there was, oh, it was such a moral panic. The Hells Angels are coming to corrupt your daughters and do whatever else. And society really, you know, and went up and, and here's the guys. They're just acting goofy and being friends. Oh, this is a nice one. This is the standoff between the, uh, between the, the guys of the gang and the regular guys. The American Motorcycle Association, in response to what happened in 1947, at uh, Hollister, they said, look, 99% of people, motorcycle enthusiasts, are good law-abiding citizens. So the, uh, the outlaws took the moniker one percenter. They we're the one percent, we're the elite. They're self-stigmatizing in this way, trying to use it to create their own sense of self, class, identity, status, whatever. And he here's the real fear, right? The young Leap to Beaver looking kid would <laughs> be these guys, right? Then uh, a year later, those pictures never came out until recently. Uh, Hunter S. Thompson uh, rode with the Hell's Angels for a year, wrote the book. I should point out that from the Hollister riot to uh, the thing in Monterey and the Hell's Angels book, these things would have the effect of doubling, doubling the membership of these groups. Every time there's a big media story about this and how terrible they are, more people would get involved. Right, so in that sense, you know, the, the politicians, the people in the media, uh, law enforcement were actually generating this problem, or not exactly generating, but making it so much worse or bigger than it had to be. There's, there's uh, Hunter after the Hells Angels beat him up the last time he hung out with him. Okay, here's, here you go. Now we're go. Their credo is violence. Their god is hate. They call themselves the Wild Angel. This has Peter Fonza and Nancy Sinatra, pretty decent. <laughs> Teenage gang devs, they all talk, fight, and love just one way, dirty. <laughs> so this is sort of the corruption of women, right? Uh, 
The Wild Rebel. Now, this is like between 1966 and 1972. There's just an unimaginable amount of these movies that come out. Uh, they live for kicks. Love for kicks. Kill for kicks. All right. They're the wildest of the wild ones. See, they're harkening back to the idea of the wild ones, which at some point they also sort of like cross-reference the wild bunch, the cowboy movie. Um, born Losers. Which one of you catches first? <laughs> this is and this is actually a decent representation because it's actually really what it looked like. But there we have what woman's leg is framed. Click that if you're playing along at home. <laughs> the glory stomper, saddle your hogs and ride, man. It's the black souls versus the stompers in the deadliest psycho gang war ever waged. So look at the themes. I don't know what he's doing to that woman, if he's scalping her or uh, <laughs> taking a hair sample, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> down here you see some of the horde. The guys are riding around like playing chicken with the women that, on their shoulders. Uh, those guys are fighting. Um, get out of their way if you can, devil's angels. They're, oh, again, their god is violence and like rabid dogs, lust is the law they live by. So you've got the horde in there. You've got everyone inside consuming the flames. You've got some female corruption and fighting. <laughs> and the roar of their pipe was their battle cry, and the open road their killing fill. Uh. The savage set of seven, the deadliest of all that violent breed. Uh. Well, that's saying something. Um, again, you see, you see sex, you see rape, you see uh, fighting. Uh, and here, here's the guy doing the trick on the motorcycle. So this is sort of how, how you know, the image of society is getting of this phenomenon. And it, it, I love it. He's a cycle psycho. But notice he's, he's almost like a J. Crew cycle psycho. He doesn't have the right clothes on. Angels from hell. Uh, the story that tells it like it is. And you know, th this woman's kind of just happy to be there and. There's some fighting, and Ryan did point the gun at the head again. Uh, when he wanted a town, he stole one. When he wanted a girl, he grabbed one. When he wanted a cop, he bought one. Ah. <laughs> Where did he get the money? That's right, so when he stole the town, he had the money. Uh, Hell's Angels on Wheels. The shattering true story of the Hell's Angels of Northern California. The violence, the hate, the way out parties. Exactly as it happens. Um, this has Sonny Barger, the guy with, with the head wounds that you saw earlier. Again, down the middle of the, of the shot, what do you see? There's the horde. Uh, on the one side, there's some fighting and some romance. Up top, they're riding on a woman. I'm not exactly sure why, but that's, that's part of what they do, I guess. It's actually how it happens. The cycle savages, hot steel between their legs. The wildest bunch of the 70s, roaring through streets on chopped down hogs, right? Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure how to qualify this. Uh, there's the horde, there's the horde, there's, for some reason they're just standing there proudly. Um, what was, th these were flyers? These were movie posters. Movie posters. Yeah. Before they didn't have Fandango. This, this, and that was 1969. So it sort of started in 66. So this, that's only three years worth of biker movies. <laughs> all right. Leather on the outside, all woman on the inside. The Hellcats. Right, so you have men on the one side, the female gang on the other side. She's got an eye patch and a chain, like she's a pirate. I don't know. Uh, and then there's each, each woman has a breakdown of who she is in the gang. This is the eye patch chain one. Uh, oh, good one. She Devils on Wheels, by far the most exciting picture of its type ever filmed. The most exciting picture of its type ever filmed. As far as we know, there's only been one other female banker, <laughs> but I guess. Uh, Soft hell, guts as hard as <laughs> guts as hard as the steel of their hogs. She devils on wheels, riding their men as viciously as they ride their motorcycles. What kind of color is this presented in? The best kind of color, blinding color. <laughs> because I want to go to a movie and be blinded. Uh, C, the authentic initiation ritual, never before dared on film. C, man-eaters on motorcycles, feared by the men they use as lovers. C, now this, C, female Hellcats ruling their men with 
tire irons as their instrument of passion. <laughs> what? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot to point that out. Anyone could lose their hand over, head over a woman, but this is ridiculous. This woman is kicking something and decapitating this man. <laughs> Maybe the tire iron isn't so bad. I don't know. Uh, okay. This was the rumble that rocked Las Vegas for a wild, wicked weekend and the deadliest gamble ever dealt. Hell ever dare. Hell's Angel 69, featuring Sonny Barger and Terry the Tramp. These guys got so much work that actual Hell's Angel, they had like SAG cards at this point. It's literally true. Um, and this is funny because uh, this was 69. Uh, that's what year. Um, in, in the 90s, there was a big fight in Laughlin, uh, which is a casino town, I'm not sure where. And it, this kind of movie actually came to life in a weird way. Uh, the most vicious and violent film of the decade, Satan Sadists. You see, uh, you see, uh, obviously, what you see, he's got his Nazi prayer for now. This movie is obviously big in Germany, if you look at the tag there, because it's in German. I, I don't know. Uh, run, Angel, run. He squealed on his gang, and the word was out. Waste him. Right? So, obviously, by this time, there's... there's it, Movies have to figure out how to differentiate themselves from the other. There's been a lot. This one involves a, a, a bike jumping over a train, as you can see down there, <laughs> as, as bikers are wont to do. And this, this young woman is dancing, She's happy, and they're fighting on top of a bar. Uh, mad dogs from hell, hunting down their prey with a quarter ton of hot steel between their legs. Naked angels, right? It has a plot of a two-year-old daughter. This is not what you want to end up with the Hell's Angels factor tattoo. You see, here she is, just happy to be there. The horde. These men are engaged in some kind of activity, and the young woman looks jealous. I'm not sure. <laughs> Meet a debutante in a leather scarf. Too young, too tough, itching for action. To look for it, she'll make it where she is. Hell's Bells. <laughs> Women's legs as frame, that's on your scorecard. I don't know what they're doing, they have a gun with that woman, and there's some guys riding motorcycles. Oh, here, okay, so here, after all that, we, sti we get to the, after all that, we get to the first legitimate movie of the whole, that isn't just grindhouse garbage. And look, look at this poster, right? Uh, a man went out looking for America and couldn't find it anywhere. And he's looking. And Peter found it, I'm looking, right? And look at his motorcycle, Jack. Okay, what's on the back? A flag, an American flag, right? So this is a whole, the biggest hit in cinema today. This is a whole shift, right? So this, this is kind of the bookend. This is kind of really the punctuation, the end of the motorcycle uh, gang movie thing. There are a few stragglers I'll show you, but this is, this is where it kind of stops. Oh, same, same time, uh, also 1969, Altamont. Right, the Rolling Stones hosted a free concert at Altamont Speedway uh, Racetrack. Uh, this was their response to Woodstock, which was just a little bit before. And for security, they hired the Hells Angels because having seen all those movies, it seemed like a good idea. Uh, people were killed. It was a, you know, and kind of, you look at the, this is the reality, this is the way, you know, art, like in art, where you have this sort of horde and this fighting, and, you know, there's a good movie about that, obviously. Uh, Jack Nicholson, The Rebel Rouse, had Bruce Dern and Diane Lance, a pretty decent cast. So these were, again, a little more serious. Oh, and this is classic. This is, this is kind of the end of it. Hang loose when you make the slaughterhouse run down the gauntlet of violence in a war of survival against psycho freaks and dune buggy straights. Now, if you, I pointed, there, was a, there was almost the same image was used in an earlier poster. I pointed to it, I don't know. And it's like... These are the, there's the horde, they're fighting, they're fighting the dune buggy guys, who are the straights, the good guys, I assume, and they're lassoing this woman. So, it's getting pretty crazy. They're, they're, what's left at this point is, is just bizarre. Uh, they live hard, they love hard. Angels die hard. Chopper outlaws, usual thing. Woman's legs is frames, the horde fighting. 1970. Oh, this one is great. This movie had to be re-released under a different title eventually. It's the dirt, Dirty Bunch on Wheels. Snarling angel, engines, dark goggles, high handlebars. The army handed them guns 
and a license to kill. The losers, right? Now, the premise of this movie is that the in, during the Vietnam War, the government takes the Hells Angels and sends them to Vietnam to fight a jungle war on motorcycles. <laughs> <laughs> now, eventually, this was re-released in, in uh, the American Valor series of DVDs, or probably VCR tapes back then. But it, it got retitled Nam's Angels because they didn't want to call it The Losers because of the history of the, of the war. Mm. And that's just so, <laughs> so amazing to me. And like, there's like this romance element to it. It's, it's not, it's, you know, like the other ones. Oh, they ride to love, they ride to kill. The peace killers. So this is reflecting the same sort of sentiment in, in, the, uh, in the broader culture. There is a motorcycle gang. They see the uh, leader's ex-girlfriend somewhere. They follow her to the commune where she lives. And they go and, you know, kill all the hippies or whatever they do. So this kind of conflates the outlaw and the hippie together. Some machines are more than most men can handle. Uh, the horde up top, the sloshing over man, the woman with the chain again, and uh, some violence down at the bottom. Women's leg is frame. Again, note it. Uh, don't muck around with a Green Beret's mama. Chrome and hot leather. I don't think there's anything else to say, is there? I mean... And finally, it reaches its peak. This gang thought it was tough till it found a new type of hell. The Bride of Satan. So, when you look at this, and it's not on your school card, but you could write in werewolf. Uh, this woman, he, uh, he stole her from Cirque du Soleil or something, I think. Uh, she's holding this scar. All I can see, alas, poor Yorick, I knew him, Horatio. <laughs> can you just imagine that? They've got to chase him with it. Obviously, the biker gangs are now trying to get to it. They're chasing them, and uh, who knows? I didn't see that one. Yet. Um, oh, so then it all changes. That's like, that's like the early 70s. By 74... You see, we go from hell this and hell that and Satan and werewolves to Fonzie. happy days, right? Where you have Fonzie. What's, does Ed, I, I gave this presentation on Monday in a friend's class, uh, just, just the uh, poster part, and a lot of them didn't know who Fonzie was, but I know you people know because you're good people. Um, hey. <laughs> what's Fonzie's backstory? He was a biker. He was in a gang called the Falcons, which he left. He was in high school. He dropped out. And what they do, he befriended the nerds, right? And then, it, and then at one point, he, he became this sort of like, like John Wayne at the end of The Searchers, kind of in and out of the house. Like he's in the, he's, he doesn't live in the house with a nice family. He lives above their garage. And he's like, he's not something you keep in the house. He's something you keep in the garage. Uh, but he becomes more and more domesticated. And eventually when, when the mean cop, I can't remember what his name was, but I'll give you a sign poster uh, if you can remember his name. Uh, comes to run Fonzie out of town because he's a hood. You remember, you remember this episode? All the people put on leather jackets and t-shirts and, and say they're like Fonzie. Aww. You, Elaine didn't have a TV growing up, so she, this is new to her. She'll tell you all about it. Then, oh! Fonzie of today, Daryl from Walking Dead. I don't, I don't know that anyone knows Daryl's backstory. But if you look at uh, Daryl here, you'll see he has all the classic tropes of uh, the, the classic motorcycle gang thing. Uh, motorcycle with the SS uh, logo, the leather vest, which has, you know, a real biker jacket wouldn't have that, but close enough. And he's, they all carry knives like that. Mm. So Daryl's kind of a version of that. Then you have True Detective. Did you see True Detective last year? Uh, True Detective had this whole element where Matthew McConaughey, I can't see that very well, but Matthew McConaughey had been undercover, he, his life was messed up, he went undercover with his motorcycle gang, it got more messed up, and it led to one of the ultimate moments in the, in the film, where he, in, the, in the miniseries, where he's back undercover with the motorcycle gang. And so there's another, we're seeing a sort of little bubbling up with the motorcycle gang. So, here's where the fiction and reality start to come back together. Um, this is the television show Sons of Our Anarchy. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Just wrapped up this year. Um, this is, this is a, a, a real motorcycle gang patch. 
that goes on the back of a vest. It has the, this is called a rocker, it's the top rocker. It says the name of the, of the club. The bottom says where they're located, it's usually a state here. And then some logo in the middle and MC for Motorcycle Club. Before they made Sons of Anarchy, they spent some time with this, with this club called the Mongols, which it was a, a Latino answer to the Hells Angels, because back then the Hells Angels would only allow white guys in. So when Latino guys wanted to be bikers, they had to start their own thing, and they had it made a more open club. So uh, the people who made Sons of Anarchy spent time with them and modeled some stuff off of them and modeled some stuff off of what's been written and known about actual Hells Angel stuff. So the patches are very similar, even though the Sons of Anarchy are really supposed to be the Hells Angels. Um, this, is, this is from a website. Right, this is a real biker guy on the one side with the Mongols thing, and this is from the TV show. And what I, what I like about these images are they're made separately, but you're going to see more and more of these just, ref they're like mirror images. So this is the leader of this club, that's the leader of the fictional club. This is, the, here's the horde like you see in the, uh, in the posters. So, you know, they, they have websites, they sell t-shirts, and they post like Facebook pictures of themselves. Here's the gangs, right? Oh, I like this a lot because this is uh, a, life, a Life Magazine picture of the actual Hells Angels from 66. They sort of tried to duplicate it on the show Hells Angels, Sons of Anarchy. They, they really appropriated a lot from that. And this is kind of the guys from the real club. They've got a big uh, logo behind them and they're they don't, they don't, those guys don't ever take pictures with women for some reason. And then here, uh, here's another one. Liam, you know where this is. Here's the guys hanging out. There's a woman. Yeah, but that's the TV show. The, the real guys never have women. This is, this is the real, it's the actors taking a picture with women. These are the real guys. Never, and those are famous Mongols. Do you mind if I experiment with the lights? Sure, screen? do whatever you'd like to do. Sure. I think. I think. I think you might have to go with those right there. Yeah. Much better. Okay. Thank you. You want me to go back to the movie posters again? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. So Sons of Anarchy is all about Jax, who uh, is this young, struggling father uh, trying to make it all work. And, and who's that innocent guy like there? Who <laughs> is that? Uh-huh. So, thank you. That, those were the days. Evan knew me back then. So this, this is another example. This is where we start getting into what I was talking about with Jesse. Um, you know, Hunter S. Thompson really established the Gonzo journalism with the Hells Angels book. Uh, and Sons of Anarchy, the television show, appropriates so much from that. And even an image like this is an obvious, you know, copy. Um, and then you saw, this is from Sesame Street. I don't know how many of you have uh, children. <laughs> but... Imagine, you know, Satan sa from Satan Sadists or whatever movie poster to Sons of Poetry on Sesame Street. They do The Raven, which is kind of a dark poem, but still. And it, it, the characters are actually represent the guys from the shows and they're named. So it's, it's a really, really funny. My kids didn't get it. Um, okay, so here, here's what we're talking about. Maybe this is where, where Jesse could come in. Um... As I said, Je Jesse wrote this article about uh, how, how sociology needs to get more back, tell, tell, correct me if I'm wrong, get more back to sort of going out and do, doing wild and crazy things. Jesse, as, as I told you, Jesse went to Afghan, Iraq. Iraq. He went to Iraq to study how people become police officers. And that that's, that's blows my mind. And so, Jesse, what's the argument you make uh, in the paper, So rather than having me muddle it? Oh, uh, the Gonzo paper? I mean, essentially what you said, that there's certain, especially, I mean, it's kind of a neoliberal pressuring towards this mm -hmm. model of pumping out publications and that kind of thing. It puts a lot of pressure on, you know, a low-jit model where you could change, you know, half a variable and get a new paper. Um, but then it kind of ruins, I think, the spirit of, especially when we're talking about why people do sociology in the first place, which is then systematically beaten out of you in the process right. of graduate school and onward, uh, and just an idea of trying to open up spaces back for that. And especially um, when you talk about sort of the intersectional identity for like, you know, a, a white guy, it's by far the easiest to do this. And so trying to like open up spaces because the sort of, um, especially there's a long section in it, if you ever torture yourself by reading it, uh, kind of taking task to the IRB, because yeah. it essentially it shuts out this kind of uh, research, which, which not only uh, quiets research on marginalized communities, 
but also it makes it much harder for, for sort of marginalized people in the academy in general, um, and especially as I imagine you trying to pass IRB getting into motorcycle clubs. I would love to talk about that experience because uh, it's probably worse than mine. Okay, we'll get to that. Um, I, I, may, I, may, I may read some more of the paper. Um, so the idea here is, uh, there's, this is C. Wright Mills on the motorcycle, in case you didn't know. And Hunter S. Thompson was really steeped in C. Wright Mills. He used to read C. Wright Mills and was really into that. And he wrote an article for Esquire type called, said, titled, Wright was right. You know, about how, you know, C. Wright Mills. And, you know, it's so much about, you know, the middle class trap that people fall into with C. Wright Mills. And on the other side of it is like, uh, the, the motorcycle, outlaw motorcycle club culture is in response to that, right? Mm -hmm. But but for for me, this is this is what Jesse got me thinking about a lot was because I always really loved Hunter S. Thompson too. Uh, but then I started thinking about like Hunter S. Thompson's choice to kill himself at the end of his life, you know. And I start and that's why like uh, at the end of Sons of Anarchy, Jack's the main spoiler alert. Uh, oh. Jax kills himself oh. at the end of the show. I'm sorry, you came here, you're undergraduates. We should know. Uh, yeah, everyone else dies too. Tomorrow. Everyone else, yeah. Spoiler alert, spoiler alert, it's based on Hamlet, which I made you read. Uh, and th this, is, this is how he does it. He kind of does it in this showing class, showing righteousness, uh, like you thought he was going to live. Come on. Uh, this way, he drives him to a truck. And I started thinking about, you know, even even Hunter's uh, suicide note was like, because he had gotten sick, he could he was in a wheelchair, he was struggling with depression, and that's why it always goes back to my depression and that part of the story. And it's like, uh, you know, I, I only his note was something like, I only expected to pay to live to fifty. He was sixty-seven. I was grieved for seven. No more parties. No more running. No more swimming. And it, it was and I didn't buy it. You know, Hunter uh, Hunter I think did what he did. To escape, you know, he did lots of drugs and lots of alcohol, and went out and did these wild things and wrote and lived this kind of outrageous life, which is cool. At the same time, I think a lot of it was retreatism and hiding, whereas you know, just the more Gonzo thing might have been to write it out, you know, write it out till the end and and get that part of the human experience. So that's what Jesse got me thinking about a lot and how that relates to you know, the traps that C. Wright Mills talked about. Um, here, here's some foundational pictures. I showed these to my kids today. They said, is that, who is that? That's me, and the, the top one is, is the baby, and my brother as the, uh, he kind of looks like uh, Velma from Scooby-Doo in that picture. Elaine <laughs> 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 knew that when she died. And that's me on my motorcycle when I was a kid. Uh, and this, this is uh, more like sons and daughters. <laughs> and shifted, but those are my kids. So I, that's uh, oh, okay. I'll, that's that's all of that. Um, I'll read a little more. Can I ask you a question? You want to sure, go ahead. Ask me a question. I, I'm curious about the racial issues. That it's white guys and then the yeah. Latino guys, and what what's all that about? Well, I mean, the the thing was. Uh, Originally, it's these white guys who can't have white lives. You know what? They can't achieve the status that they that they would expect as white guys, right? So they create this different world, and then it's like, well, okay, we have. Uh, do we want to let the minorities in and kind of sink lower? You know what I mean? Because if they were really, because my my argument is that when I say sons of conformity, I mean that. I think they create their own culture that is so rigid and so restraining that they're not rebels. Or else they're rebels who just made a different thing that's the same, you know. Uh, and, and that's sort of my thing against Hunter S. Thompson, who I, who I like, but they're, you know. Okay, as I described uh, above, my access to the Visigoths was contingent upon my brother's friendship with Thor. So I asked my brother to make contact with Thor, and well, arranged to meet. Like more light now. I don't care. No, it's fine. But okay. thank you, though. I appreciate it. Um, so I asked my brother to make contact with Thor and arrange a meeting with me. Unfortunately, my brother extended this invitation via text message. He wrote, hey Thor, my brother Norm would like to talk to you about the Visigoths. Immediately upon receiving this message, Thor called my brother and explained 
that nothing about the Visigoths could ever be put into writing. He went on to explain that due to an unflattering documentary portrayal of the group by filmmakers granted access to the club, the Vis Visigoths were no longer talking to, talking about the club to outsiders. While some may have called it a day, with that, a wolf must push on. Mm -hmm. Some time passed, and I asked my brother to talk to Thor again and see if he could convince him to at least meet with me. Thor was unwilling, but he agreed to talk with me on the phone. The Thor of uh, the Thor. The conversation went as follows. Norm. Hey, Thor. Thanks so much for calling. I really appreciate that. That's okay. No problem. That's my Thor voice. Um, okay, uh, so my brother explained the situation to me, and I wanted to see if there was some way we could work around it. Yeah, but I can't talk to you about the club. Sure, I understand that, but maybe we could meet up, and I could talk, and you could just listen and see if you could do anything with what I have to say. I understand that the club isn't talking to the media right now, but I'm not the media. Maybe we could come up with something that you could run up the chain of command and see if we could get approval by the national leadership. See, I'd like to write a book about you, and I think it would actually be something that's good for the club. No, I can't talk to you because I get kicked out of the club uh, for talking to you about the club. Yeah, but don't, you don't have to say anything. You can just listen. No, sorry, I can't do that. Yeah, but uh, I'm sure we could work something out. I mean, I work with the police and prisons all the time, man. There's always a way in. See? Right there. We work with the police. <laughs> I mean, someone with the police connections is a problem. Yeah, but I'm not a cop. I'm a sociologist. Even still, you say you're around someone, let's say you're around someone from an organized crime group, and you ask, hey, what's that tattoo mean? We can't have that. I mean, we're not criminals, but we're a one percent motorcycle club. Sure, there's, yeah, sure, yeah, but there's got to be some way to make this happen. Look, I love your family, and I don't mean to be a dick, but if you were my own brother, I couldn't talk to you about the club. It's almost Bruce Springsteen, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> there's just no way. Thunder Road. Uh, okay, I don't want to push this any further. I hear what you're saying, and I respect your decision. Hey, I'm sorry I couldn't help you. Uh, out here, but uh, thanks for thinking of me. Toward the end of the conversation, um, Thor was talking a bit faster than he had been. I took this as a sign of stress, so I backed off. At that point, I felt discussing, I felt that discussing why he couldn't talk to me was making him think about the potential consequences and what he would lose if kicked out of the, his club. If that was the case, he could have been experiencing anxiety and as a result of my attempt at negotiating my way to the club. So ethically, I had to stop at that point. And that is as far as I got with my attempt to join the Visigoths. How are we on time now? Yeah. It's 5.25, so we get uh, yep. open it up to questions sure. if you want to go another 10 minutes or something. No, we'll take the questions now. So this is a paper that I had intended to finish 19 days ago, and I have now nine more days to finish. I'm, I'm on sabbatical this semester, and I have a very rigid schedule I've made for myself. So help me finish it. So I've got questions. Yeah. So obviously you're writing around policing and the ways that certain particular, I guess, goals or desires that um, some might have or realize when they go through the socialization of becoming part of the police force. <coughs> Do you see some of that represented in the guys that are going in and through initiation into MCs? I see exactly that. Uh, when I, when I, Erwin Goffin, when, when he talked about uh, mental patients and mental hospitals, he talked about the moral career of the mental patient, and he talked about the, the three stages, the pre-patient stage, you know, before your patient, the inpatient stage, and the, then the ex-patient stage, right? And I talk about police the same way in terms of socialization. Like, first there's the, there's the recruit, then there's the rookie, then there's the veteran, and I break down that way. And socialization into, uh, you know, part of this, I read every book. That, and it's funny because since Sons of Anarchy came out, everyone that's ever driven by someone on a motorcycle has written a book about it. Uh, all these guys now have their own books. And, that you, I've, and 
honestly, in one sense, I'm glad I didn't do it because I just got so sick to death of it, kind of like when you're dis doing your dissertation, like you're, you once liked that topic. Uh, so what I found was to get into the motorcycle club, you start as a hangaround, like you're someone who hangs around. Then uh, as a hangaround, you're just there. You can get to go to the parties. No one should mess with you, uh, but you have no rights or privileges in the group. Um, if you hang around long enough and they feel like you're okay, they'll make you a prospect, which is like a recruit, just like the police academy works. And they haze you and they torture you and everything they can do bad to you. And if you make it through this, and some of these actually like, a, a number of cops have infiltrated these, these groups. So they have very serious background investigations, maybe more serious than they have for the police department. Because I wrote another article a long time ago where I actually made it into the, a police academy. Right, and I couldn't even get past the phone call with this guy. Uh, um, so that's the, the, the prospect phase. And then, then you get in your full patch member and you have all the rights and privileges thereof. Eventually you can also be an officer. There's a few ranks, high ranks in the, in the club. But, so yeah, so it's the same process. Um, you know, people pursue both of these things for the status. You know, they want to feel more, and it's, it's with the motorcycle gang, it's exclusively a masculine thing. So if, if I want to have that sense of hyper-masculine whatever, uh, th these are the places where you get it. And I, I always make the point that, you know, the guys I worked with in prison and the cops, probably these guys too are all the same kind of guys. They're wolves. Yeah, Jesse. I had a really similar follow-up question, but I'm wondering, having said the police, what sort of similarities you see between those two subcultures? Because I think, especially in terms of sort of like the silence and the solidarity, yeah. and especially the hegemonic masculinity, yeah. and, and sort of what kind of strength you see between them. It's funny because a lot of cops have started their own biker gangs Gosh, where, yeah. they, where they make their own jackets and everything, and it's, like I said, it, it's... It's funny because it was the former chief of police in Pittsburgh who ended up in prison, but I, I, I was talking to him one time, you know, the guys on each side, they're the same guys. And he's yeah, like, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and, and these guys have that esprit de corps, right? Mm -hmm. They have, uh, you know, they want to do good in their communities, in, in their own ways, right. right? And cops do too. And they both want to, in some ways, be above and beyond the law. Could you extend that parallel to gang membership? I would expect. I mean, I don't know too much about general gang membership, but but I'm sure that this <coughs> thank you. The status thing is uh, you know equally huge. Status, I mean, I don't know the. Be, God, I'm sorry. Oh, status and maybe belonging. Belonging, but as I understand it, in in the really bad gang neighborhoods, you almost have to be in a gang to be okay. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? In, in, in pla but I think there are pla other places where people seek it out for that sort of a thing. Yeah, no, in in uh, the stuff you've done on policing, are there differences between the white police and the police? Major and differences. The um, and in terms of the socialization process and their connection with yeah. one another. And then, you know, these are, you talked about the uh, motorcycle gangs are white guys. Mm -hmm. the other guys can't get in. Yeah, they have to make their own clubs. All right. And, I just, I remember, I know nothing about this, but I remember the discussion of Ferguson where yeah. black police actually have to have their own separate organization. Yep. So it's just like, it's the same phenomenon where, you know, the white guys formed the Hells Angels and the black guys, you know, formed whatever they formed or the Latinos formed whatever they formed. Uh, the black guys formed the Fraternal Order of Police or whatever, and the black guys formed either the Black Shield or the National Association of Black Law Enforcement. <laughs> So you, you do see that, and I've, I've written a lot about the way that uh, in the police academy there's all this talk about how we're all, the, we're, all, uh, we're all blue. Black and white don't matter anymore. We're all blue from now on. Um, but in reality, some of the social network stuff I do demonstrates that you know, they really do, it does not happen. So it's like there, there's this idea that you, with policing, it's like you know, we ask police to do an impossible job, right? Keep us safe in a democracy for very little money, right? And while you're at it, don't be racist, even though you're part of a racist society. Um, so it's like they can't even do it among themselves. So it, it's, such, uh, it's such the wrong way to go. I mean, yeah, obviously you want good things, but you've got to really go at it a different way. Yeah. 
So it seems like a theme that you're kind of pointing to in this presentation is this co-constitution of identity and mystique, right? That yep. kind of tacks back and forth between, you know, the guys in the gang and the posters that start sort of resembling the gangs and the gangs that start to resemble the posters. And then you tell this uh, story of your own experience as well, kind of trying to approximate this or, or become part of it and how that shapes you. And, and so I'm wondering if there's, if you could comment on sort of this process of identity shaping among wolves in particular? Yeah. Are there something about the wolves that leads to this particular pattern of, of identity formation? I'd, I'd like to read just a little bit more for that. Um, I titled this, uh, the last section was where I talked about how they didn't let me in with the title that was any club that would have me as a member. Uh, th this, uh, this, this section is called a Sea of Troubles and Issues. Uh, when planning this article, I decided that returning to the psychologist who originally inspired it would have both research and therapeutic value. However, even scheduling the appointment became something of a character contest. In the years since I had been seeing him, I switched healthcare providers so a therapy session was not covered by my insurance. I informed the chair of my department about this situation and asked for $150 to cover the session. While agreeing that psychological help was most certainly in order, <laughs> my chair informed me that the department could not pay for me to have therapy. <laughs> Additionally, the college also. Are you <laughs> no, no, wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> Additionally, he informed me that he was on sabbatical and I should be talking to someone else about this. <laughs> Later, I contacted the dean of my college and asked for $150 to cover the consulting fee for the psychologist as a research ex expense for this article. I scheduled with a therapist who then canceled because meeting with me as a consultant would constitute a dual relationship and was outside the ethical boundaries. Having already been rejected by an OMC, I was not going to be declined service by a therapist. <laughs> Pressing on, I asked him, if he could meet with me solely uh, as a therapeutic client and discuss some of the insight I had gained through my prior sessions with him, as well as a paper I was working on. This definition of the situation fit within his moral universe, mm -hmm. so he once again agreed to meet with me, a lone wolf trapped in the iron cages of academic life and healthcare bureaucracy. I began experiencing a mild sense of pride to think about everything that had happened since I had last seen him. In that time, I had been granted tenure, published two articles in a top journal, and been awarded a major fellowship within my university. More importantly, I had purchased a home for my family and my children were thriving. His notes on the session indicate uh, he understood how far I had come. Client name, Norma Conti. Date of service, July 6, 2013. DX296.25, major Depressive disorder, full remission! <laughs> I mean, he wasn't that good of a therapist, who knows? <laughs> um, Mr. Conti was last seen a couple years ago. He requested a follow up appointment to discuss his progress. His physical appearance has changed. He lost weight, appeared fitter, has grown his hair long. He does not, he notes an increased emphasis on physical fitness, but also notes maintained gains in terms of mood and mood regulation. He does indeed present today in a calm, pleasant manner with a positive self-view and positive view of his life since termination of psychotherapy. He noted increased self-acceptance, a sense of newfound security, stabilization of his family relationships. In regard to the latter, Mr. Conti notes that he has been able to integrate insights about himself that he had obtained through the process of therapy into his academic and writing interests. With, which has subsequently leveraged great job satisfaction. Summary, Mr. Conti appears asymptomatic of uh, depressive and dysthymetic symptoms. Dysthymic symptoms. Thank you, ladies. We can talk after. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Conti requests no further assistance at this time. He leaves without any further scheduled follow-ups at this time. However, after I finish describing key moments and changes since our last meeting, he noted a very slight tremor in my voice and asked if I was nervous about meeting with him or if it was something else. I stopped for a minute and then explained that despite my continued improvement over the years, the stress of my life was still overwhelming. He noted that stress was just a Western notion for fear 
and asked what I was afraid of. I explained my greatest fear was failing as a father and the consequences of that for my children. So despite all of the gains I had made since we had last met, I still had the same degree of, I still was some degree a prisoner to the fear at the root of my initial depression. Years later, I described it as collapsing under the weight of my life. While I was uh, no longer in such danger of giving way, I still couldn't see any way out of this because I didn't understand how a father could stop worrying. In order to illustrate that, I asked him, what if, what, what if something happened to one of my kids? He re responded curtly, that would suck. I remembered why it had been so long since our last appointment. <laughs> he went on. Let's say the worst thing happened. God forbid, you go home and some tragedy has befallen one of your children. That's the worst pain you could ever imagine. But what do you do? You'll find a, you will find a way to end your suffering. You could go find a bridge to jump off of, but I don't think so. You're too curious about life, what, is it, what, it, what, it, what it's about and how it works. Dealing, that loss, dealing with that loss would be your real Visigoth moment. You run marathons, you bench press 300 pounds. Surviving something like that would be another kind of marathon. It would be like bench pressing 400 pounds. For you, it would become an autoethnography. You'd be your own Visigoth. Maybe you can keep that like a key tucked away inside of yourself just in case you would ever need it. I want to know how he knows about auto if not. He's a, he's a bright guy. Yeah, I, mean, I don't want to know who he is. I can tell you. <laughs> that's uh, social science. That's unusual. <laughs> of the many, many therapists I have seen over the years, he was the first to ever frame suicide as one of two possible solutions. <laughs> Still, I took his point and began thinking uh, about the Visigoth spirit and the essential draw of ethnographic work. Quite recently, Jesse Wozniak has, pub has put, invited us to reconsider the notion and practice of gonzo sociology. His article was my first introduction to the concept and explained it as one way of doing sociology without methodological feti the methodological fetishism so present in our discipline. More specifically, it's a valid approach to research where the sociologist steps out of the academic enclave into the lives of, into the lives of the people, experiencing firsthand their private troubles in order to offer a sociological analysis of the public issues to which they're tied. Wozniak bolsters Gonzo sociology by highlighting Merton's recognition that observing the strange and unexpected is essential for extending uh, existing or developing new theory. Um, so what, what I'm getting at there is, you know, that's where I get at to my problem with Hunter S. Thompson and, you know, as much as I, I love the idea of, of what Jesse's talking about, I think we, we need more of that anthropological spirit. Um, I think the, ther the therapist was right. You know, even though I make fun of him sort of in the article, you know, I, I walked out of that session confused uh, but in the time, I was like, yeah, that's what it is. And uh, Visigoth, uh, the first really good article I ever, first amazingly great article I ever published was called A Visigoth System, and it was about police training. And it's, and the Visigoths and the tribal thing, whoever can take the most punishment gets to be leader, right? So that's the real Visigoth moment. Like, are you really taking life as it comes? Are you really dealing with it? Uh, are you really looking at, you know, the, the, like, you know, the sociological imagination? Or are you looking at where the self and society come together, where history meets biography, right? Or are you just hiding and running away? So, so that's, what I, that's what I love about all that. Yeah? Um, outside of kind of internal acceptance and privilege in a group that you're trying to study, and outside of the kind of... Um, you know, self-reflection that I think you would require in order to decide that you wanted to go out into the world as you were and study some kind of mm -hmm. group that you were unfamiliar with. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit, you know, we hear about the mole people of New York or gangster yeah. for a day and things yeah. that, you know, we as sociologists would like to be involved in in order to study um, different types of people that are engaging in illegal activity. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm it's always kind of puzzled me, like, well, how, you know, by association, were these people not held accountable, or, you know, how, you know, Dr. 
Stackhouse and I were just uh, speaking about going through the IRB for some class projects that we're working on, and um, it just seems so rigid according to the law, and I, I just have a lot of confusion about how we can study things, you know, and maybe Jesse can kind of help answer this. I don't know. I think I'll learn we'll take that, Jesse. this <laughs> by reading his paper, but... I don't know. It's probably the list. I mean, well, that's it's a big problem with, with the sort of IRB conception in a lot of ways. I mean, one that's just a bastardized medical model. Uh, in fact, the, the first IRB I ever had to do in grad school actually asked me how I was going to determine if my subjects were pregnant and what I was going to do about it. I was like, it's going to make for a pretty awkward interview. Um, but I mean, the, the thing is, it's just sort of it, it, it it's sort of a continual fight, and that it's going to take people pushing the boundaries against it. And it's essentially, I mean, one of the arguments I make, and one of the reasons I talked about sort of identity privilege stuff, is that like. Uh, I am afforded those privileges that I can push against it, and so I feel it's kind of like in my position somewhat of a duty to push against those boundaries so that others who don't have the sort of large well of reserves they can step back on, culturally speaking, uh, can also can open up those spaces for them. But otherwise, it's just going to be a huge aesthetic. Uh, I mean, I, I put a, a part of it in my, in my paper, I talk about how um, at one point in time I really felt like explaining to them that I wasn't traveling to like another country and not back in time, uh, that like telephones and the internet and everything exists there too, um, because I basically had to prove the existence of civil society in the country I was visiting. Uh, and there's certain, it's certainly part of, you know, the, the sort of legal uh, culpabilities that they're most worried about, but also there's certainly this sort of undercurrent of xenophobia and, and basically racism, if we're going to be honest about it, um, in terms of anybody looking to do something outside the paradigm. And so one of the things I, I'm arguing for is for... You know, if enough of us just kind of say, like, well, I'm going to do it anyway, uh, you know, eventually it kind of forces a renegotiation of those boundaries. So IRB is going to protect these people by being racist against them. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, so I'm for being for me, I'm hardly a sociologist. Um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was interested in the concept that um, you had mentioned that these motorcycle gangs especially, uh, and even the police orders, anything like that, um, uh, they they are after some sort of honor. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's there's an honor portion of it. They want status of which they cannot get in uh, supposed society, normal, let's mm -hmm. call it normative society. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how that's different from any one of us, or anybody else for that matter, insofar as we all have an honor-loving part. Uh, I, I'm a philosopher, by the way, and I'm <laughs> steeped in a republic right now. But, um, <laughs> but like, insofar as we have a portion of society that loves honor, yeah. and we have a portion of ourselves that also loves mm -hmm. honor, and we just <clears throat> come about it different ways. I'm thinking of even people join churches for status within the church, yeah, yeah. or they join any, any sort of thing, and, and are we <coughs> making differentiation between healthy and unhealthy, or societally uh, acceptable versus non-societally acceptable, or what's the differentiation between someone who joins a motorcycle club that in order to join any club you have to conform to the club, uh, or any organization. What about anarchists? What's that? What if, you, what if I wanted to join anarchists? The anarchists? Oh, they're not actually anarchists. They are anarchists. That's anarchists. the problem. Okay. They have their own problem. And so, so we, we have this kind of idea of where um, you have to conform to the, to the rules and regulations of any po portion of society that we join in order to gain the status mm -hmm. that we desire. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering where the distinction is between, and just because your talk was specifically about outlaw yeah. motorcycle clubs, where's the differentiation and what are we to make of that? Okay, I, I think there's two things. A lot, in my work about policing, I talk a lot about the dialectic of shame and honor, right? Because anytime someone's pledging a fraternity or trying to be a cop, or trying to be a motorcycle gang, there's there's this thing that you have to accept all this degradation. They are gonna, they the term that was used in the police academy was lower than whale shit. I was walking through a police academy one time, and a guy, a cop, a senior cop, goes, "These people in this police academy are lower than whale shit." And I love that because the only other person I've ever heard use that expression was my grandmother. <laughs> uh, God rest her soul. Uh, and I was like, "What does that mean, right?" So the the, the recruits come in. I, I wrote about this for years. Is to help how, how they're abused. Right? And they have to take that to show that they're worthy of eventually getting to be better than regular people. You know? And that's the same thing that goes on uh, with a motorcycle gang. Those are extreme cases, that dialectic of shame and honor. But that's happening with everyone. It's happening right now. Right? We are all conforming to avoid shame and to hopefully get honor, you know, prestige or money or whatever. 
So, I mean, I don't think it's that uh, different. I think there's just different ways of going about it. But I think if they were really outlaws and really rebels, whatever, they would, they would live without it. In what sense would they have a cohesive group then? They might not. They might just come to, you know, it might just totally this organic one, who knows? I mean, there, it's are, not called there are motorcyclists who do that. Yeah. Uh, uh, they get beat up sometimes. Sure. Uh, but, <laughs> but, but the long wool thing. Yeah, but that's the thing. I mean, these, and I'm not trying to judge at all. Uh, these guys, his, maybe, not, maybe now it's not even like this anymore. Maybe this is just what it was in the 60s. But these guys came together to try to create a community where they could feel like someone, right? And that's okay, and that's an emotional need, and that's fine. But you can't be like, I reject everything. There, there's, there's sort of something happening. You know, I, I can see what you know. But in a way, it's kind of just classic rebellion in the Mertonian sense, sure, right? Absolutely, yeah. The rejection and the substitution mm -hmm. of values. So mm -hmm. maybe not rebellion in the sort of sense that we'd like to use the word. Yeah. But. And, and it's rebellion, and, you know, I, I think it would be better to do something more, and if you want to be dead around, do something more revolutionary. Like, you know, like, let's, there's a big... If you want to say that Hunter S. Thompson was a rebel and C. Wright Mills was more revolutionary, I think. Oh, sure. Yeah, I believe that. Yeah. Does anyone ever leave these groups? And yeah, people fun? leave. People just age out of it. They, their lives change and it's it just, you know, come and go. As a point of, for, for, for the yeah. pictures, just a, just a quick, uh, I noticed that uh, the uh, Mongols all had uh, ape hangers and mm -hmm. uh, is it coincidental that the Sons of Anarchy also had the Mayans use uh, yep. exclusively a Exactly. I mean, it's modeled exactly after them, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'm wondering if a so-called gonzo conception of sociology would rid the discipline of, you know, if you're going to jettison the methodology, if that would jettison the scientific... No, it's not, I, I don't want to speak for Jesse, but I'm going to. Please. Uh, I'm going to. Um, <laughs> that would probably sound better. Go. Uh, no. Uh, that, won't, that won't make any of that stuff go away. That stuff is, that stuff is established. That stuff isn't going anywhere. There's, that's where the grants are. Uh, I think Jesse just talked, we, we need more of this. We just need more of it. But, How is it not just journalism, then, though? Well, I mean, I see the thing is, I'm essentially hearkening back to Burroughs' conception of two sciences. Um, that there's this, this sort of formalistic, you know, what we think of as, you know, white lab coat, capital S science, but then also a sort of reflexive science that's built off of um, not so much understanding through quantitative power, but understanding through real embedded living within it. Um, but so I guess ultimately what, what differentiates from journalism is, you know, there, there are PhDs in sociology, right? That, that it, it's like contextualizing it in a way in these large social forces that Yes, we can't speak to it with the saying that my p-value is not less than 0.05 and ergo the police at this training center are like they are everywhere, uh, but it's the sort of embedded lived reality that, and I'm sure you and have a million stories of that. You're, you're linking it with theory, too. That's, that's not in journalism. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's essentially, you know, it's the, the classic uh, mills of c connecting the micro and the macro, just sort of uh, doing it in a more lived, embodied sense as opposed yeah, to it. Irving Goffman wasn't interested in, uh, in correlations and, and coming up with... Uh, Scientific law, as we still call them, the sociologists. It's a long tradition of different, you know, of interpretive, critical, of scientific sociology. All of that has, has been around for ages. And uh, Goffman, after all, coexisted with Talcott Parsons. Exactly. And I don't think it's still science. This is a, a yeah. different conception of science, another model of science. I, th I think you're 100% right with that. And I mean, it kind of goes back to that thing. Uh, how do you do that with IRB? I mean, you, you managed to do it. Can it? Is it a hurdle? Yeah. Can you get over it? Probably. Uh, you know, I don't know. But it, it's something to think about. Maybe portraying it as phenomenological science would, to use the jargon of the academy, might uh, help in that instead. Yeah, and it would further differentiate it from mere journalism. That's not bad. Because it's, it sounds like the crux of how this method would work, the Gonzo uh, version of sociology would be, would be, and this was what I got out of your talk, because this was a very phenomenological account. Exactly. It was tied to your experience, and the same with your experience in Iraq. Yeah, and I think it, it's sort of, it's partially just bringing that experience to the center, right, that there's no, instead of pretending to have an objectivity that's impossible, mm -hmm. it's bringing the experience and, and the sort of lived, the, noting the many ways in which it's not objective, uh, which is as much part of the story. When you're talking yeah. about ethnography, I mean, the researcher has to be as much part of the story. Yeah. Not that the narrative's about them, but obviously I'm going to interpret it differently than you. And, and the, 
the sort of classic answer to that was pretend it doesn't exist and pretend yeah. <laughs> that I'm a clinic clinician and I have no feelings. Um, but essentially what, what I'm arguing for, and I imagine you are, and many others in this vein, is just to embrace that, the sort of reflexivity part, and, and that's part of the study as well, because um, you can't divorce it. And if there's something essential about your own experience, then in a certain sense it is objective. That's not just a, that would be the Husserlian point. Yeah. That would be the phenomenological yeah. upshot. That's a much more intelligent way to put it. Thank you. I don't know about that. I'll steal that in the future. <laughs> Write it down. Quick. Yeah. Norm, I was wondering, or I was struck by the timing of this article, um, and how now you're tenured and whatnot. Yep. And and I, going back to the the last discussion with the therapist, where where I'm thinking to myself, he was kind of saying, well. Now what are you afraid of? You, you know, you're tenured yeah. now, this and that. Now what's your new fear? Yeah. And sort of like, I think his point was, you're really afraid of yourself. Maybe. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but just any, any thoughts on the timing the, of the, the article, maybe how it might be different? The timing is really interesting because when I was, when I was falling apart, uh, whatever that was, I, I mean, I, I, I can't believe it didn't show. You know, I, I was just broken. And I was on the road. Like, I typed my tenure case like this, one you know, one key at a time. I was so messed up, and uh, but you know, I still had a good case and the whole thing. But I was so afraid that people would see. Oh no! If, if they see, they won't. And part of this is a is, it's it's in there. How bad? How bad I think the tenure process is, and how unhealthy it is, and how wrong and stupid it is. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and a few years ago, I gave a presentation for Seeker in this room about a destigmatization paper, and I was co-authoring it with Linda Morrison. I don't know how many of you remember her. Uh, and Linda talked about, Linda did research on mental health and mental illness and mental health consumers. And in that presentation, she talked, and I had tenure when we did this, I think. She talked about her own depression, and I just sat here and just looked like, you're not turning her through, you know, like, don't let that out, don't, whatever. And you know, some of you heard me say this, it's like 30% of our undergraduates are struggling with severe depression. I was in my 30s, you know, now I'm in my 20s. Uh, <laughs> I was in my 30s. Uh, I, I don't know how an 18 to 22 year old, I don't know how they do it, you know? So, so for me, it's about, there, there is a timing thing where you say, look, and when Jesse talks about, look, as a white male, middle class, heterosexual, whatever, I have a certain obligation to push on these other things and give other people some space so they can get up and start pushing too. Right. Uh, but with the depression stuff and all that, it's like, well, I think this happens to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so, that's the refreshing part. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and again, it's like the day I was here with my, one of my, you know, this was the one I went to graduate school with. And she's telling this story. I knew her for 20 years or something. And I felt so trapped that day. Today I feel fine, you know. So, actually, I think writing this paper, this paper has been going on, and it's getting close to being done. But uh, it just keeps evolving. I mean, writing this was it's just a way to tell, have your narrative and understand it and move forward and say, hey, you know, maybe I went through this, but here's how it worked, and maybe it'll do some good. Who knows? But, so yeah, it's, it's about the tenure process in some way. God bless you, kid. <laughs> I'm getting tangled. <laughs> yeah. You're a wolf. We have time for one or two more questions. Yes. Hi. So, completely off topic. Um, I'm curious. You said that uh, the, the OMC kind of came out of this, like, fight they had at this, at uh, the American Motorcycle mm -hmm. Association meeting. It was, yeah. And it was very much blown out of proportion. Yeah, exactly. How much would you say that the... Um, OMCs are kind of trying to live up to a fictional image. That, that's what, I, maybe I'm, it's hard, I can't really say 100%, that wouldn't be fair. But it's, see, like, when you look at those pictures, it's like, where's, where's the fiction, where's the reality? I mean, uh, and the thing is, every time something happened, the, the riot happened, doubled. Hunter S. Thompson's book came out, doubled. Sons of Anarchy, doubled, right? Uh, so it's like, a lot. You know, because I think in reality, you know, sometimes I like to sit around and do the guy thing, be with guys and do whatever, uh, but at some point it's got to get boring, right? And you're like, we're not involved in any international crime wave or anything. <laughs> we just suck. I don't know. Uh, let's do something. 
Go murder our mothers. You know, like they, I don't know that's what happens in the show for the. <laughs> I told you everyone dies. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, Ted. What about like the other side of those MCs where a lot of things they do are to make money mm -hmm. or um, you know, they're they're involved in drugs mm -hmm. a lot and um, like weapons and stuff like that. Um, I think that's like really important too because when you were talking about how they do it for like the reputation and status, it made me think of how a lot of them probably do it for the other reasons where, you know, they're really in it for money yeah. and stuff like that. There's this idea that's been in the media and law enforcement that you know, every OMC is a criminal syndicate. <laughs> you know, and it's, it's not that. There are some that are really focused on making money through drugs or whatever. Uh, and then, but then there are some where a couple guys are doing whatever they're doing, right? So there's these, like they'll talk about the 20 year war between the Mongols and the Hells Angels and 15 people died or something. Like, well that's a shame if there's 15 people, that's terrible. But 15 people over 20 years isn't exactly Iraq, right? It's a war, it's a biker war, right? And these are criminal gangs and they're, but, you know, yeah, there are guys in these, clubs doing whatever they do, but most of them aren't geared towards that. So, I mean, yeah, I don't know. Thank, Thank you. Thanks for being here.